You always want to have sort of, oh, now it seems like it's. Now it it's we're on. live on, live on Facebook. So All right. Here now. <laughs> Great. Well, welcome back to our semi-regular True Play check-in series. The True Play check-in is our chance to share conversations we're having with our friends and colleagues about the theory, philosophy, practice, and implications of True Play and Angie Play. I'm your host, Jesse Cafino, co-director of the True Play Foundation. And I'm Christina Tapia, the director of global practice for Angie Play. Um, for more information about Angie Play, please visit our website, angieplay.com, or find us on all major social media platforms. Um, also during this conversation, feel free to put any comments or questions that you have in the comments below. And if we have time, we'll try to get to as many as possible. Thanks so much, Christina. And today we are just incredibly lucky to be joined by Dr. Peter Gray. In our world of play and liberatory education, Dr. Gray is as close to a household name as you can get. Dr. Gray is research professor at Boston College, author of the book, Free to Learn. He is a tireless researcher and advocate for the child's right to play, both through his nonprofit's Alliance for Self-Directed Education and Let Grow. And if you haven't had the chance, we strongly recommend that you become a regular reader of his blog, Freedom to Learn at Psychology Today. And there are two new books by Dr. Gray that are going to be released tomorrow by Tipping Points Press. There is so much more we could tell you about Dr. Gray, but let's jump right in. Dr. Gray, thank you so much. There's so much we want to discuss with you. But before we get to sort of our questions, we just wanted to give you an opportunity to share anything that's on your mind these days. <laughs> well, I could go on forever with that, but um, uh, you did mention that uh, a couple of books uh, uh, printed by Tipping Points Press. So Tipping Points Press is the press of the Alliance for Self-Directed Education. I played a role in founding the Alliance uh, some years ago. Um, and uh, people who are interested, these, these books that Tipping Points Press is publishing are really just collections of um, essays that I've written for Psychology Today magazine. They're collections around particular topics. And so um, people who are interested in that, you could go to the Alliance for Self-Directed Education website and find the uh, books. Um, the All profits for sale of those books goes to help support the Alliance. I'm going to, for people who are interested, I'm going to be talking about two of those books. Um, one of them called Mother Nature's uh, Pedagogy which is basically how children are designed to educate themselves and play, of course, is a big part of that. And the other one is how children acquire so-called academic skills through their own efforts when they're free to play and explore uh, in a literary and, and in, a, in a literate and numerate world. So if you're interested in those things, I'm gonna be speaking at uh, eight o'clock Eastern time uh, tomorrow, you can find how to register for that by going to my Facebook page, just go Peter Gray Facebook page. And um, if you're interested in that, I also the other thing if I want to plug something <laughs> is, uh, Please, is, yeah. uh, is the organization called Let Grow. Uh, Lenore Skenazy is the prime mover of Let Grow. She's the author of uh, book Free Range Kids. And there's a brand new edition of that come out 13 years after the original edition. I've uh, had the opportunity to preview it and it's, uh, it's got quite a lot of new material. And of course, Lenore is famous for uh, advocating uh, for children's freedom. Um, and, um, and the Let Grow organization has been um, bringing play, real play into schools, um, not like recess, not like the way, uh, not certain, uh, uh, and uh, so as we go along, I may refer to some of the things that we've done uh, through Let Grow to, to bring real play into schools. So I'm, you know, I'm ready to go on. I could talk about my definition of play and all of that, but I would rather do so in terms of responding to the questions that you might have that are relevant to the things that are on your minds. Well, thank you so much. That's um, really great opportunities to learn more about your work, um, about you and Lenore's work. And just um, thank you for, again, putting all of that time and incredible energy into bringing play to children. I mean, it's, it's part of our work as well. Right. I think you bring up a really interesting point, this question of the definition of play. 
Um, you know, we do a lot of work with schools in the United States, and somewhat in Europe and in other parts of the world. One of the things that we've been grappling with, wrestling with, um, is this idea of the importance of adults being a part of children's play, of guiding children in their play to particular outcomes. I'm wondering from your perspective as somebody who understands child psychology um, and learning, how you respond to that. I know for us, it's a challenge. Well, um, so let me, let me start by reviewing very, very briefly how I do define play. Um, uh, I define play as an activity that has five components, five characteristics. And the first and most important of those characteristics is that it is self-chosen and self-directed. If an activity is not chosen and directed by the children, <laughs> it's not play. So if some adult stands up in front of a bunch of kids and says, now children, we're all going to play this, it's not play. <laughs> it may be a worthwhile activity. It may be a playful activity. I'm willing to use the word playful as an adjective for activities that have some of the characteristics of play. But for an activity that is not self-chosen and self-directed by the children, I would simply not call it play. The, one of the primary things that children learn in play is how to initiate and direct their own activities. It's how play is how children learn to run their own lives. Uh, children in our society today, especially more so than in the past, are constantly being directed and managed by adults. And play is the opportunity to get away from that, <laughs> to learn how to manage yourself. And that's a pretty important skill to develop. And even little children, by the time they're two or three years old, they want to have a certain amount of time where they're managing themselves. <laughs> and that's really what play is. Uh, so th that's the most important characteristic. But when parents, you know, adults may think they're doing a favor by telling children how to play and direct their play and solve the little problems that occur in the course of play. But they're not because they're interfering with the child's ability to do those things himself or herself. That's the, that's the task of growing up is learning how to do these things yourself. So that's the first defining characteristic of play. And the other characteristics of play I also think bear upon what, what you're saying, at least the next three of them. Second characteristic of play is it's not something you're doing for some extrinsic reward. You're not doing it to get praise from some adult or anybody else. <laughs> You're not doing it to get a reward. You're not doing it to get an A. You're not doing it for a gold star or a trophy or anything like that. You're just doing it because you want to do it. And that's the aspect of it that I think makes a lot of uh, people, whether they um, say it in these terms or not kind of think a lot of adults think of play as kind of a waste of time you know you're not getting anything for it <laughs> we sort of have this view that um that everything you do should have some kind of you should be doing it for some kind of tangible reward you know something you're just wasting time otherwise right so um but think about it this way that when you're doing something just because you want to do it that is really finding your passion. That's discovering what you like to do. What could be more important in life than that? You know, life would be pretty tedious if we only did things that we don't want to do, right? So, the, uh, so what children are doing in play is they're following their passion. I, you know, I'm sure that you've heard many commencement speeches where the speaker says, follow your passion, right? And so here they're speaking to people who are at the end of high school or the end of college even, and they're telling them now, follow your passion. But if they haven't been playing, how do they even know what a passion is? So that's the second. The third characteristic of play, I think is also quite relevant here. And, and that is that play, although freely chosen, is not free form activity. Play always has structure. Uh, 
people use the term unstructured play, and I don't think there's such a thing. My, by my definition, there's no such thing as unstructured play. It's always structured. The structure can change from moment to moment almost, but it's structured. Children are structured. It's a structured activity. Children have in mind what they're doing when they're playing. They're not just randomly doing stuff. They have, if they're if they're building a sandcastle, let's say they're building a sandcastle, they're not just randomly piling up sand. If they're playing a make-believe game, they've got uh, certain roles they're playing, they're structuring their activity. And if they're playing socially, they're talking about that structure. They're negotiating that structure to, with one another. They're, they're planning it together. So I never use the term unstructured play or unstructured because I would say all it's all structured but if it's I think what people mean when they say unstructured means that it's not structured by some adult but I've already said that's not play if it's structured by an adult so that's the third and the fourth characteristic of play is it it always you know to to some degree or another involves uh imagination. It involves stepping out in some sense of the real world into a pretend world, a different world. Children know the difference between so-called serious activity, even though play can be very serious, but they even as serious as they are, they know this is not the serious world. This is the play world that I'm in right now. You're stepping into this different world. And when you step into this different world, you are in a world where because it's not being evaluated by anybody, because you are always free to quit, that's an important characteristic of play. That's part of self-chosen and self-directed. You're not only free to choose to play, but you're always free to quit. And, um, and, and so if it gets stressful, too stressful, gets unpleasant, you can quit. You can try things in the play world that you might be afraid to try in the real world because in the play world, it doesn't count. You're not being measured. It's not going on any kind of a report. And because you can always quit if it doesn't work out so well. So you can try climbing that tree. And if it gets a little too frightening, there's, there's no there's nobody there urging, telling you you've got to do it. You're just, it's your own decision. You can go as high as you feel comfortable going and then you can come down. So you can try things. You can try being a kind of person that's different from you in reality and see what it is like to be that kind of a person. So it's really, it's, it's a simulation world. It's a place to try things that uh, that you might be afraid to try in uh, in the real world because because you're not necessarily good at it, and that's why play is such a powerful vehicle for learning because you can freely try things that you're not good at, and then you can and you can learn how to do it, and then if you want, you can bring that skill into the real world at some point. So those are the main characteristics of play. The, the final characteristic of play is that it's is that it's conducted in a in an alert, engaged, but not overly stressed frame of mind. That's sort of a frame of mind that that a lot of psychologists refer to as flow. You're mentally involved in what you're doing. You're um, you're, you, you lose some track of time and place because you're so involved in what you're doing. You're, you have to be mentally involved. You can't be really, you can't be passive in play. And, but yet you're not overly stressed. And it turns out that's the frame of mind that is that researchers have shown is best for learning anything new. It's best for any kind of creative activity, any kind of thinking out of the box, any kind of problem solving that involves novel insights and so on occurs best in that, in that frame of mind. So I think just that definition of play gives people an idea of uh, how important it is, what it is that children are learning in play. They're also because of the fact that children prefer to play socially, they prefer to play with other children most of the time. Solo play is, is, um, is chosen sometimes if you're doing something artistic, for example, and some kids like more solo play than other kids. We differ in personality in that respect, but everybody wants, essentially every child wants to play with other children. And when they're playing with other children and the fact that 
play of self-chosen, self-directed means you've got to figure out how to compromise. You've got to, you've got to learn how to negotiate with the other children you're playing with. So there's a lot in preparation for play, in breaks in play. There's a lot of negotiate. What are we going to play? You know, who's going to be doing this part? Who's going to be doing that part? And you're learning how perhaps you're learning what uh, arguably is the most important human skill, which is how to get along with other people. And that's another reason why it's extremely important that children play with other children without adult intervention, because the important thing that children need how to learn is how to negotiate with their peers, <laughs> how, to, how, to, how to deal with somebody who's on an equal level with you, not have somebody in a hierarchical structure come down and solve your problems for you and tell you what to do. Play is how you learn to deal with one another as, as peers. And you need to learn that or you'll never have, for example, a good marriage. You'll never have real friends. You'll never have good work partners if you can't do that. So to me, it's no surprise that natural selection produced in children this extraordinarily strong drive to play with other children away from adults and to play socially so that they're that you know this is nature's way of teaching children how to compromise how to pay attention to their partner's needs how to overcome narcissism how to not be a bully because if you're a bully your playmate will quit <laughs> and leave you and uh, that's the natural consequence so um so it's extraordinarily important things that our children are learning and when we adults intervene and solve children's problems for them uh, and so on. We're preventing them from learning those lessons. I think something that we often look at, um, it's really interesting you bring up this idea of unstructured versus self-structured, that children bring a lot of structure. We look at a lot of sort of intentionality. We see children in play as having very specific intentions right. from the youngest ages. And something we talk to programs, particularly I know before we got on, you mentioned Carissa Christner at Madison Public Library. They have a drop-in program. We kind of advise programs is that in the first 10 to 15 minutes, new children, new space, new materials, they're going to throw those materials. They're going to bang them together because they're seeking to understand what these materials are what the qualities are, how they interact with each right. other, what the boundaries of the space are. So they're something that would appear quote unquote chaotic or unstructured is actually a very specific process of seeking to understand something. And so even if it doesn't look like children building with a particular intention, or even you know a toddler moving around a space and mapping out kind of the contours of the space they're in, there is deep purpose in what children do when they're given that time and space. I think one question I would have is that um, with Miss Chung and Anji, she introduced this approach to more traditional, more conservative parents within rural, a rural Chinese social cultural context. They didn't want their children to play. They were afraid that they weren't learning. They were afraid that they were gonna be in danger. She said, you know, first of all, reflect on your own memories of play as children. And they always came up with memories that were free and open without adult intervention over extensive periods of time where they had the most meaningful experiences of their youth. But she also realized that as parents, they had a valid concern that their children be safe. They had a valid concern that their child learn. And so she had them come in and observe their children playing and they saw the learning that was going on. And so in that sense, very elegant way of showing parents how learning was taking place. We often say play is enough, right? You don't, you don't need to add in all this uh, play is enough, but how do, you, how do you contend with the fact that a lot of times people are trying really hard to shoehorn outcomes into play? And how do you prevent that desire to prove its value from turning it into something that is chasing those outcomes? Yeah. Um... So let me back up just a moment. And um, so you started off by talking about what children are doing. They'll enter a room and they'll bang things around and so on and so forth. Um, this is 
this is, there are different kinds of terminologies here, but I actually distinguish in my mind between exploration and play. So when children mm -hmm. first go into that room, they're exploring the room. They're, they're figuring out what's there. <laughs> they're going from one thing to another. And one of the things that children really wanna know about anything is what can I do with this thing? Even little babies, yeah, as soon as they can manipulate any object, they're manipulating that object to try to figure it out. Once they've kind of figured it out, then they may play with it. Then they may do something that's kind of structured with it. They, they, they create some kind of game with it. But I, I, I find it useful, not everybody does, but I find it useful to draw a distinction between curiosity as the drive that promotes, uh, that promotes exploration of that sort, where you are, you, you may, it may look kind of random, but it's not actually random. You're trying it out in different ways. You're trying to see what you can do. What, even little babies, what will happen if I drop this China cup on the floor, right? You know, what will happen there, there, what will happen if I stick my fingers in this electric socket? That's why we have to baby-proof houses because they're very curious and they're always exploring the world that they're in. And that exploration drive, you know, continues on as children as children get older, it becomes more sophisticated as they get older. So, um, so just to make that point, but the issue of um, it is, you know, it's unfortunate we have become absolutely obsessed <laughs> with the concept as a society and and. China was ahead of us on this <laughs> with the concept uh, that childhood is a period of um, academic learning, <laughs> uh, a period, and even worse, a period of resume building. <laughs> and um, and if you're not, if it's not clear what kind of school-like skill you're learning in this activity, or if it's not clear how this is going to help you eventually get um, some kind of a diploma or a degree or something that's going to in China get you a bureaucratic job or in the United States get you into an elite college, maybe the same in China now too, then um, is kind of a waste of time. And so we parents have been more or less brainwashed in this direction. And we we, our children are spending way too much time doing academic stuff. I mean, the, the, the number of hours um, of school activity per day and the number of days of school year have increased ever continuously ever since I was a kid. So that school is now more or less a full-time job. In some cases, more than a full-time job, once, certainly once you're in high school. Kids, even, even elementary school kids are doing homework. Even kindergarten kids, in some cases, are taking home, worksheets home. I mean, this is outrageous that children should be doing this. But we have no, more or less come, you know, somehow as a society, we've all been brainwashed into thinking that children have to start learning this stuff really early or they'll never learn it, which is simply not true. There's zero evidence for it. And there's a lot of evidence that all this early academic training is having harmful effects, that it is creating. I've actually written a, a recent blog post on these this per, for people who are interested, but there's good um, research evidence, in fact, experimental research evidence showing that children who are given academic training in preschool are more likely to form learning disorders <laughs> than children who don't, who are just home during that period, <laughs> let alone ch compared to children who are in a play-based uh, preschool. So, uh, so, we, so we are really misguided on this and, and we need to get the truth out. We need to, the, the science has proven that this is no good it's not, it's not beneficial to be giving early academic training to children. What children need is play. And in play, they develop the intellectual foundation that then can allow them to find meaning in the academic learning that they're doing as they go on through school. But you've got to have that intellectual foundation. Children are, children are learning a lot. You're not directing their learning and you can't predict exactly what it any child is going to learn on any given day. 
but you know that children are learning how to take control of their own behavior. They're learning how to think. They're learning how to think hypothetically. They're learning how, you know, one of the things that I said about play is that it's, it's in a fantasy world. Well, when you're in a fantasy world, you are engaged in the highest order of human thought, which is hypothetical deductive reasoning. So, you know, imagine little children pretending that there's a troll under the bridge. So they've made this bridge, right? And there's a troll under the bridge. Oh, there's a troll under bridge. We better not go under the bridge or the troll will eat us up or we better get treats to treat the troll so he, so he won't eat us up. This is hypothetical deductive reasoning. You know, the development psychologist Piaget argued that children are not capable of hypothetical deductive reasoning until they're 11 years old. He was completely wrong, obviously wrong. Anybody who's watched little children play know they're engaged in hypothetical deductive reasoning all the time. They are developing their minds. They are developing their ability to think logically, to understand the world around them. They are also acquiring sophisticated language. And the reason they are is just as I said before, they have to talk to one another as they're playing. They have to negotiate what they're playing. And it's important talk because they've got to figure out what are the rules? How are we going to do this? What are we doing? They have to be clear to one another. There's actually research showing that when children are speaking to other children in the context of play, they're their language is much more sophisticated than when they're talking to adults, either in the classroom or at home. <laughs> so we keep emphasizing how important it is for adults to talk to children. I don't wanna unemphasize that. Sure, that's valuable for adults to talk to children, but it turns out that children are really practicing sophisticated language when they're talking with one another in the context of play. So, you know, they're learning language, they're learning how to use language. They're, this, is a, this is a precursor for being able to read. This is a precursor for being able to, uh, uh, they're learning how to think. This is a precursor for any kind of understanding of mathematics, if you want that later on. You can memorize arithmetic procedures, but that doesn't mean you're learning anything that you understand or is meaningful. And so the other thing is when children are playing, uh, you know, it's not bad to have in, in the children's environment games that involve numbers. I mean, something like Candyland, you know, you're counting out spaces, you're playing, you're playing hopscotch and you're counting the spaces that you're moving. They're, they're children, even little children get into numbers when they're playing games that involve numbers. Um, and as they get a little bit older, they might be playing games that involve words and they're learning some words, but that doesn't mean that you're setting up play deliberately for that. But in a literate and, and numerate society, it's not a bad idea to, you know, and it's going to happen anyway, that there are some numbers and words in the context of where children are playing. So I think that we, we have to take a broader view of what education is. Education is the acquisition of all of those kinds of skills and abilities that enable a person ultimately to live a satisfying and meaningful life. And, and what those are, are different, ultimately different for different people, but some components of it are similar for everybody. We all need to know how to get along with other people if we want a happy and meaningful life. We all need to be comfortable in our own skin if we want that. We need to know, we need to have a certain kind of self-confidence. We need to have a certain degree of courage. I can do this kind of dangerous thing and I'm not gonna die. I can control myself. You know, we want to prevent children from doing anything that looks a little risky that they might hurt themselves in. But children deliberately play that way, as, as do the young of other mammals. And they play that way for an obvious beneficial reason. They, it's not consciously done this way, but the reason natural selection created the drive to play that way is because if you play that way, you will learn how to deal with fear. You will learn how I can put myself into this somewhat fearful situation and I can control my head, I can control my body and deal with this. I can climb that tree and come down and wow, I can do that. And the child who does that is less likely later on to have some kind of a panic attack when faced with a real emergency and more likely to be able to save herself or her child or anybody else because of that. So I think we have to, uh, we, 
I think the larger point I'm making is we have to have a broader concept of education. <laughs> if we try to direct children's lives so they're learning the school lessons, those are the those are in some sense the easiest things to learn and they can be learned at any time. <laughs> These other things like learning courage and learning how to initiate your own activities and getting along with other people. These are far more important skills. I mean, so much of your, what yeah. you're saying is resonating really deeply. Like um, I was a teacher for many years and, you know, if you don't teach the children their colors, they'll never learn their colors. I'm like, I don't think I've never seen an adult that, you know, was interested in colors that had no idea what, you know, this, all the spectrum of colors were. And I was just thinking also to what you're saying, I think that, you know, this pandemic has been terrible for various, various reasons, and it has affected lots of different people unequally. But I think something that has happened was that it's given children this opportunity to have that time where they can explore these, their own interests on their own because their parents are working and they're just like, okay, we'll go play in the backyard or do whatever, like go occupy your time and they're coming up with such amazing things to occupy their time and learn. One of my friend's children were really interested in bike riding and they created a pump track in their backyard and then they were figuring out like well you need to use this type of dirt versus that type of dirt and this type of weather affects it in this way and this is how we have to fix it and all that learning that was happening as a process of creating this thing that they were deeply passionate about was far superior to anything that they could have learned in the classroom around those same subjects. Yes well I'm glad you raised that. Um... The, uh, we actually at Let Grow organization conducted a systematic survey of how families were adapting to the uh, school lockdown. Um, we surveyed uh, 1,600 families in um, one month after schools locked down. So most schools closed in sort of early to mid-March. We did this study in uh, mid-April. Uh, and then we surveyed another 1600 families in mid-May. And this was a demographically representative sample of families throughout the United States, uh, across social class, across race, all with children somewhat older than the children you are most often working with, but children from the age of eight to 13. And we, and we, we surveyed uh, the parents and children separately. Uh, and, what, and we found um, contrary to what you keep, people kept putting into the newspapers, all the fears that psychiatrists and psychologists and other so-called experts were saying that the children were going to not know what to do. You know, they're gonna, they're just pro, they're, 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 the structure of their lives has been disrupted, and so they'll have mental breakdowns as a result of that, and they're going to be stuck home with their parents, and and this is going to be you know, drastic results were being talked about and predicted. Um, what we found was that uh, on basically every measure, the children were doing better psychologically than they were before the pandemic. So we, one of the questions we asked of both the children and of the parents is, is the child uh, more anxious or less anxious now than before schools closed? And both children and parents overwhelmingly said less anxious. <laughs> One of the questions we asked the parents was, are you having more or fewer conflicts with your child now than before the pandemic? Believe it or not, there were more parents who said fewer conflicts than who said more conflicts. And again, to me, that wasn't surprising. What is it that parents and kids have conflicts about school largely, right? You're, you're, you've got to get the kid up in the morning before the kid is ready for school, ready to get up. Uh, the child is overtired. You've got to make sure they do this homework. You're, then you're bussing, you're taking them around from one activity to another and you're constantly nagging your kid, get ready. We got to go out to karate class or whatever the heck it is you're taking the child to. And all that suddenly was cut out. <laughs> And what the parents observed, and we heard this from the parents, and we also heard it in a different way from the kids, is they didn't need to amuse their kids all the time. <laughs> that the kids were very good at finding things to do. That we found at first they were bored. They reported, yeah, bored. Well, yeah, I was bored. A very high percent of them said they were bored. But you know, boredom is a good thing because it sort of stirs you to find something interesting to do. And we found exactly what you're saying, that 
the kids fun. A lot of them learned how to ride. Some of them learned how to ride a bicycle for the first time. These are kids who never had a chance to ride a bicycle before. Uh, I'm a bicyclist myself. I go out every morning for a 10 mile bike ride. And then before that lockdown, I never saw kids out on bicycles. <laughs> Suddenly now I was seeing kids out on bicycles. They were, some of them were learning how to cook. They wanted to cook and they had never had the, and the parents didn't trust them to cook, but now they're home and the parents are busy. So they say, so the parents show them how to cook and the kids are so proud to be able to do that. They're picking up new hobbies and new, they're, they're all kinds of constructive play. And they're of course playing a lot of games, including video games online. So this is a way that they're keeping touch with their friends and they're using social media, which is a good thing to keep in touch with their friends. So in fact, it was not the terrible thing. Now, when I submitted this article for publication, the editor was a little bit um, dubious because of the fact that this ran so counter to what so many other people were saying, and it ran counter to some personal reports. Of course, I don't want to say that this was great for everybody. There were some families that suffered during it, no, no doubt. And I certainly don't want to say that the pandemic was a good thing. I mean, it was a terrible thing. But, um, but overall, statistically, the kids were doing better now. So then I really looked into the literature. It turns out that there were at least four other studies that showed the same as result as we did. One in the UK uh, uh, and, and two others, three others in the United States that showed very similar, very different methods, but also at least on the dimension of finding that the kids are less anxious and less depressed, that the kids were actually doing better, at least early on in the pandemic. Now, by the time as summer went on and by the time school started up and all the odd ways that it started up in the fall, I believe there's now evidence that by then kids were, were suffering again <laughs> psychologically. The anxiety of school and the additional anxiety of school when you don't know from day to day, is it going to be virtual? Is it going to be in class? Am I going to be exposed to the COVID virus? Is it going to be, and for some families, virtual schooling worked well, but for many families, it didn't work well. And schools were in some cases doubling down on the homework because they believed. So to me, it wasn't surprising that anxiety and depression picked up once the school year started again. So at any rate, I, um, this was an interesting little experiment, a kind of a pause in all the busyness that we've put children into that allowed children to do some of their own things. Now, some parents, I, it's not the majority of parents, but some parents were so impressed with what their children can do when they have more time on their own devices that the rate of actual homeschooling doubled. <laughs> um, so that it went from about 5% of American families, of American school age children were homeschooling to 10%. I don't know how many of them are going to continue with it, but I'll, I'll, I hear from a lot who are going to continue with it because they saw that their children, when their children had more time and their children had the opportunity to create their own activities, they saw how much the children were learning. Some parents' eyes were open and they saw that and they said, I need to preserve this amount of time. And also other parents, even those who are keeping their kids in school are saying, well, I'm going to, I'm going to cut down on urging my child to join all these outside activities and, and because I think my child needs more free time. So um, I think there was, I think there were some some uh, learning experiences that occurred as a result of, of the coronavirus uh, pandemic. Certainly. Yeah, and I think it's interesting at the beginning you were talking about sort of um, in China, the United States, how there's this desire for these very scarce future positions of you know, socially defined success or achievement, right? right? Those things that as parents, you know, maybe 20 years ago, 30 years ago, with a high school education, you get a high paying, secure blue collar job. But now if you don't go to an Ivy League school or get some advanced professional degree, then you're you know, doomed to some sort of future that a parent would feel uncomfortable with their child assuming, right? Um, what's really interesting in the last 20 or so years is that within China, within the Ministry of Education, there was a recognition of the growing scientific consensus that academic learning for the youngest children was counterproductive. And so they instituted something they called uh, which meant like 
eliminating the primary efficacy of early childhood education. And so now in Anji and other parts of China, you know, you have extensive public early childhood programs serving children ages three to six. You now have in that first year of primary, they're really trying to get rid of the academics because they saw the deleterious effect it was having. Mm -hmm. They said that, you know, problem solving, confidence, habits of learning or just a passion for learning is more important. And Ms. Chung often gets this question like, oh, well, how are you preparing the children for this transition? How are you making, and she says, you know, I have them for three years and it's my job to protect their childhood. You know, it would be great if everything else changed, but I have these three years that I can protect them. And that's, that's what I care about, right? right? However, what I would say is she is a superintendent. She was a superintendent for a public early childhood program. The schools have walls, they have teachers, they have schedules. They have rich outdoor environments with minimally structured open-ended materials, large, there's risk. You know, her five key principles are love, risk, joy, engagement, and reflection. But, you know, after children play, they come in and they draw a picture of their play. And the teachers write down the children's words, their description of their play that day. The teachers are present and taking videos of play. And then the children lead their own discussion of those videos. They're, they're using that complex language that you're describing. They're talking about their hy hypothetical thinking, their deductive reasoning. They're using meaningful language to talk about, you know, the, the, the compromises and collaborations that they have to engage in as a group. There are advocates for play that say adults should really just back off. No videos, no drawings, no talking about play. This is for children. You know, mind your own business. Obviously, there are those people that say, oh, well, let's turn these into activity sheets and let's then do like project-based learning and like, let's make an ice cream shop because you like ice cream today. I wonder how you feel about this structure that's been, that's part of the experience in Anji Play Schools. Yeah, it's a really good question. And, and I, I'd have to be somewhat humble in my response to that because I, um, because I can understand, I can sympathize with it in a way. I can understand the logic of it. There's, um, uh, and if you are, if you, are in a traditional school and you do have if you are if you think of schooling as important this is probably not a bad way for children to be um, engaged in in literary <laughs> kinds of activities uh, where they're talking about something that they themselves did or they're talking so i would worry a little bit that it um it colors the play if they're thinking about while they're playing, well, how am I going to report on this? <laughs> you know, am I doing something that will result in a good report or not? You know, that would that would just in some sense destroy the freedom of the play. I don't know to what extent that happens. So I guess I'd probably to really have an opinion about that, need to know. What I what I can say is that the idea that the idea that See, I, I have been studying for many years now children who are not schooled in the typical sense of being schooled at all. So they're, they're like playing their entire life in some sense. Now, it's not, you know, play evolves, it becomes more sophisticated, it becomes more like hobbies, it becomes coordinated with either study involved in what you're playing and so on and so forth. But I've, I've studied children who are at, in the uh, young people who are being homeschooled by the method called unschooling, where there's no curriculum for them. And I've also studied the graduates and students of um, democratic schools where there's no curriculum and where basically the children are free in an age mixed environment. So there's children at uh, Sudbury model schools where there's children from age four on through high school age. And they intermingle and the, and the staff members don't call themselves teachers. There's no tests being given. And my first study many years ago was of the graduates of one such school, the Sudbury Valley School, which abs that's where I really, it was after that that I really got interested in playing. This was many years ago. And it completely reframed my thinking about education because here were people who were not doing what we think of as school. And they were coming from a wide variety of backgrounds. Many of them were coming to this, this school because they were failing or not doing well in the public school in one way or another. And, and at that time, there, they, there were about 100 graduates, 90, I think it was, and we contacted most of them, and they were doing very well in the real world. They were getting into higher education if they wanted to do that, even though 
some of them had never taken a course in their entire life, <laughs> had never taken a test until they took the SAT test to get into the college they wanted to apply to if it required that SAT test. They got into college and they did well if they wanted to do that. They were in the whole range of jobs that we value. It simply put a lie to the idea that you've got to do all this stuff that school is telling you to do or you will be a failure in life. <laughs> it's simply not true that that's the case. It is true if you consider yourself to be a dropout, if you think of yourself as a failure and, you, and, and, and everybody else thinks of you as a failure, then you know that's the problem or you think you're stupid and and, and so on uh, but if you if you deliberately take this approach i'm going to take charge of my own education and i'm and and what you find is kids are not when they take charge of their own education they're not doing anything like school for the most part they might when they're preparing to take the sat test they might be sitting down and preparing in a very deliberate stu studio stu studious like way studying SAT prep books and so on to, to learn the math that this, particularly the math that they need to know to do that. But, um, and the other thing that I think parents, there's some other thing, there's some other facts that simply parents don't know and most teachers don't know. We have this view that it's so important to get our kids into some kind of an elite college. Otherwise, they are not going to be successful in the world. So middle class and above parents are pressuring their kids almost while the child is still in the womb. They're pressuring the kid. You know, they're doing everything they can. They want to get the kid into the most academically successful preschool to go on to the most academically pressured kindergarten to go on and so on and so forth on to and then into all kinds of advanced placement courses these are the kids in some ways that are suffering the most there's actually evidence that they're suffering from depression and anxiety at considerably higher levels than the rest of uh, the teenage population by the time they're in high school so so that's the attitude that many people have now the truth of the matter is there's a there's a, there are two long-term studies that have been done by very highly qualified um, mathematician and a uh, economist working together, looking at the long-term effects of going to a more elite, more selective college versus uh, just a regular college that pretty much anybody can go to. And they found that once you control for background factors, once you control for social economic class, and once you control for indices of motivation and ability to begin with, it makes no difference <laughs> whether you go to the fancy elite college or you go, but even by the most conventional measures of how much money you're making at age 40, uh, let alone by happiness. There never was any evidence that going to an elite college makes you happier in life. <laughs> But, um, but for parents who care about a high status job or how much money you're making at some point in your life, it doesn't even matter for that. <laughs> it doesn't matter for that. So there's no reason for being this high pressure that you've got to get these kids into some kind of an elite college. And the kids get convinced that they've got to get in. And so they feel pressured. They feel you have, I mean, there are, you may know more than I do, but there are some studies showing very high rates of suicide in China among school-aged children. We also have a growing rate of suicide among school-aged children, especially in the high pressure schools. So somebody who doesn't make it into, you know, who, who God forbid gets a B on a report card, you know, they think this is the end of their life. And this is, um, it's just outrageous the kind of pressure people are feeling. But if people knew the facts, you know, the other thing we should realize, we have downgraded the, what might be called blue collar work. But uh, we should not, you know. Yeah, every time I need a plumber or an electrician or a carpenter, I'm aware they're making a pretty good living, right? And, and those jobs can't be shipped off to China. And those jobs require brains as well as some physical abilities. Those, those are not stupid. You can't be stupid and do those things, but you've, you've uh, so we should not be downgrading those. And yet we've practically done away with the whole concept of, of technical training in high school. We used to have technical schools where you could go and take a track that's not an academic track, but now be 
because of the standardized testing, which is at, on this so-called academic track. Even if you go to one of those technical schools, the whole emphasis is on the academic training. And instead of instead of saying, you know, this is a place for people who really are good in their with their hands and their brains, and they want to do things with their hands and their brains rather than to memorize academic information. Something that, so, this, uh, that you're just talking about and it's really making me think about is like the role of the adult in any of these situations or the role of the facilitator or the person that's seeming right. power, right? So like at the at, at schools that practice unschooling or well, I don't right. know, it seems really funny to say, but um, the adults have this like really deep belief that those children, regardless of what they're doing, they're learning and it's important. And right. um, I see that also in the Anji play schools. And so something that's really interesting is you're like, oh, well, the children become like aware that maybe this type of play is more important than this other type of play. What's super interesting to me is I've seen a teacher respond the same with the same enthusiasm to a child drawing a picture of a potato that has nothing to do with anything that they played with as like the same enthusiasm, like, oh my gosh, this is amazing. Tell me about this potato. And like, as a child that is engaged in deep, like complex problem solving and thinking in a different way. And so I think it also comes down to like, who are the people in these schools that are, that the children are interacting with? And do they have that passion? And do they see them as completely capable and amazing and doing all this incredible stuff and are excited about that with them alongside them instead of like placing judgment on you should be excited about these particular things at that particular time. And does that have an effect? So the staff are, are really not doing a lot of that. The staff kind of um, are the adults in the school. Um, they, they care for the kids. They love the kids. They're kind of like uncles and aunts to the kids. Um, and they are in some sense, I suppose, cheerleaders, but they, they're not people who dish out a lot of praise or criticism, uh, because in a way that's also always a way of manipulating, even praise oh, is a way of manipulating, right? So they don't want people, they don't want the kids to be doing things so that they'll get praised by the staff members. So they don't, they don't dish out a lot of that. They, they care for the kids, they're there for the kids, they're glad to answer questions. Uh, if somebody came who drew a picture and said, so what do you think of this picture? They would respond, they'd more like, they wouldn't necessarily say, oh, it's a great picture. They'd say something like, oh, that's, kind of, that's interesting. Um, do, so what is this? What did, what did you have in mind as you did? They might talk Tell to me more, that, right? right? Tell <laughs> yeah. me more. More often though, the kids will go to other kids and you've got kids ranging in age from four to 18 or 19 at these schools. And the kids are constantly learning from other kids and there is scaffolding going on, but it's not scaffolding from the adults, it's scaffolding from, so when kids are engaged in age mixed play, the, which occurs all the time at the school, the older kids are boosting the younger ones up to a higher level of play, whether it's physical play or mental play. So, you know, one of the things we observe in this, in this kind of a school is that little children can play at activities that they want to play at that they would be unable to play if they were just with kids the same age. And that's true of everything from playing a um, basketball game, you know, I, uh, to uh, playing co computer games that involve words on the screen, to playing some kind of game that involves numbers. I've, you know, for example, just to take one example, you know, six and seven year olds rarely would be able to play an organized um card game uh, with one another because they'd lose track of what they're doing. They'd show their cards, they'd get distracted. They, um, they'd have difficulty remembering the rules and it would just fall apart. But over and over again, I've seen six and seven year olds playing card games with 11 and 12 and 13 year olds. And the older kids are reminding the younger kids what to do. They're sort of scaffolding them. You know, they're playing these games, not because they have to play the games. Little kids want to play the games. And they want to play, especially with these wonderful, great older kids. And the older kids welcome the younger kids in because partly because they need more play partners to play the game, but also they enjoy the younger kids. But they have to remind the younger kids what to do. They're always not always nice about it. You know, they, you know, hey, stupid. <laughs> that, can't you see that those cards are already down? <laughs> you know, or, but that's how learning occurs in that kind of an environment. And it's very natural. And it's not because it's it's not being done for the sake of educating the other child. It's being done simply for the sake of the game. But you can see all the time how children are learning and play. 
with younger children, you know, uh, you, you know how um, if you read a developmental psychology book in the younger years, you'll often hear about the, the view that two-year-olds are not capable of social play. They play parallel. They can't interact in play, <laughs> right? So, um, but um, the fact of the matter is two-year-olds can play socially perfectly well with four and five-year-olds. <laughs> because the four and five-year-olds scaffold them into it. The four and five-year-olds, so, and, and in the world, in the real world, until we, until we started segregating children by age at schools, children were never segregated by age. And so in the, in the traditional real world, two-year-olds were never just with other two-year-olds or even just with other two and three-year-olds. They were intermixed with kids from age two on up. And so they're always playing in that kind of a social context where the older kids are scaffolding them into play. So they might be, it's not uncommon in traditional societies for a five-year-old to be responsible for taking care of his or her two-year-old sibling. <laughs> well, the five-year-old is playing with other five-year-olds, but you've got the sibling there. And so you work the, you work the two-year-old into the play. That's the typical way that play has occurred in the in the world throughout hum, human history and but now we segregate children and, and we prevent that kind of natural scaffolding to occur the more we can integrate across age uh, the more effective play will be um, something that comes up for us um, we work with head start early head start programs we work with charter schools we work with home-based care settings. Um, we work with private, not-for-profit preschools and um, places for infants and toddlers, is there's been an increasing focus, I think, on social-emotional learning. Now, for us, creating safety for children is of critical importance. You know, right. adults that are reliable, you know, those routines and structure that's necessary are responsive and give children time and allow children to the greatest degree possible to meet their own needs and attend to their own needs. But one of the things that we have observed you know, and Anji, certainly in the situations you're describing, a lot of space is given to children to solve their own problems, to work through things. Mm -hmm. We get a little bit of pushback when we tell teachers to step back, take a video and let children work through something. Right. We're told sometimes is that we should go in as adults and label emotions for children or tell children how they're feeling and put words like we need to use our words to talk about how we're feeling. For us, you know, we think, you know, a child has complicated emotions. We can't know what they're thinking. It's going to change from time, from moment to moment. Focusing on something that we're making a guess about is probably not super helpful in developing a strong social, emotional independence. I don't know, as a psychologist, as somebody who studies these things, what is your response to this idea of the necessity of labeling children's emotions for them? Yeah, I, I think it's not necessary. <laughs> I think it's like, I think it's just like we don't really need to teach them the color words. <laughs> you know, they're they're going to learn what anger is. And they, these are words in the, and, and labeling your own emotion. This comes out, we become a very therapy oriented society. We become so introspective and therapy oriented. And I'm not sure that that's all for the good, to be honest. Uh, I think that it has, I think that there's, that sometimes we become too focused this way. We begin to, in, instead of being focused on what do I really enjoy doing, we become focused on what kind of uh, emotional experience am I having from this? You know, <laughs> the experience is the experience. Now I do think that in play, children are learning incredibly important social and emotional skills. So I've talked about the social skills. They're learning how to negotiate, how to get along, how to make friends, how not to be, how not to be uh, narcissistic, how, you know, because that's because you've got to do that in play. They're also, they're also learning how, they're also learning how to control negative emotions, which is really important. And as I talked about how they're learning how to control fear by playing in ways that induce a certain amount of fear. And they're learning, I can manage this. I can feel fear and I can do this and I can control my body and my mind. That's really important. But children also sometimes get mad at one another when they're playing. So they're playing a little, they're kind of playing, play fighting and something. One of them accidentally hurts the other one. And the one that's got hurt gets mad. Now, 
if there's an adult there, nine times out of 10, maybe 90 times, times out of 100, the adult will step in at that point. But what if the adult didn't step in? <laughs> what if we let the kids work that out themselves as kids always have in the past? Kids always get in. I mean, when I was a kid, in the 1950s, we didn't have adults around when we play. We got mad at one another and we worked it out and so on and so forth. And so kids get mad sometimes in play, but what are they learning when they get mad? They're learning how to control their anger, just like they're learning how to control their fear when they're playing with fear. So you get mad. Now, what yeah, so let's say we're playing, we're playing, a, we're playing some kind of a game and you have accidentally hurt me and I'm mad at you now. So what are the things that I could do? I could, I could lash out violently. Well, that absolutely ends the play. You're out of here if I do that, right? So, but I really don't want to end the play. I'm motivated to play. Um, I could have a temper tantrum, but I have never witnessed another child responding favorably to a temper tantrum. Parents sometimes will, uh, you can sometimes get your way with parents with a temper tantrum. It doesn't seem to work with other kids. So what does work? You know, what works is I have to I have to do what psychologists would say. I have to express my anger in a more constructive way. I have to do something like, wow, that really hurt. You know, <laughs> you know, I, I'm not going to keep playing with you if you're going to play that way. Uh, that's, that's assertive. <laughs> and, but it's assertive in a way that doesn't necessarily end the play. It gives you the option to apologize, to say that this was an act, this was, I didn't mean it, or even if I did mean it, I'm sorry, <laughs> you know, <laughs> and I won't do it again and let's go on. So children in play, as long as there's no adult interrupting, interfering, are learning how to deal with anger as well as with fear. Those are the two primary negative emotions that, that people experience. I think there's also in our society today, there's a tendency to want to protect our children, not only from what parents see as physical dangers, but also what they see as psychological dangers. We're way too much focused on psychological dangers. So a kid who doesn't get invited to a birthday party, like that's a psychological danger. <laughs> but you know, that's the real world. <laughs> You're not going to get invited to everybody. The kid who, uh, you know, today, somebody's my best friend and tomorrow they hate me. Well, you know, that's pretty good preparation actually for the first time that your romantic partner that you fall in love with says, I'm going off with somebody else, you know, it's not the end of the world. <laughs> it feels like the end of the world, but it's not the end of the world. And if you have experienced those things as a child and learn to deal with them as a child, you are more prepared for those as they become even more important and more intense as you become an adult in life. We have tremendous psychological problems among young adults today, and I'm and way more problems than was true in the past. And I'm convinced that the reason for that is not because they don't know how to label their emotions. The reason for that is because they haven't had the opportunity to experience the bumps in the road of life and learn how to deal with them as they are growing up because they've been too overprotected, not only physically, but psychologically. You know, there was a, uh, Lenore pointed out to me a uh, parenting in the Parents Magazine, which is absolutely horrid in the advice they give to parents is, uh, <laughs> She, she's always pointing out to me articles from Parents Magazine. So she pointed out this article. Some reader had asked this question. So my, I forget how, something like an eight-year-old or nine-year-old child, my nine-year-old daughter is playing with her friend. And I have to leave the house for five minutes, okay? And is it safe for me to leave the house for five minutes with, remember, it wasn't that long ago that nine-year-olds were babysitting, but nevertheless, so is it safe for me to leave the house for, for these minutes? And the response was, well, even if they're physically faith, safe, here's what could happen. They could get into some kind of a tiff, 
and they could start insulting one another and you are not there <laughs> to prevent this damage that could be occurring from their angry words to one another. So, you know, this is, we're hearing this from people who are advising parents. We're hearing all these messages about protecting your child from the emotional hurts that could conceivably occur if you let your child play with another child without you there <laughs> to make sure that not only is there no physical harm being done, but no psychological harm being done. I, I just think we've become, the other thing, we're, it's almost as if we are in a mode of training children from early ages on that you're not capable of solving your own problems. You need some authority figure. And the result of that is by the time young people are off in college, what's happening now in colleges, and there's a lot being written about this, and in, in, for example, in, in the journals of higher education, uh, that um, college, the mental health centers are being overwhelmed. And the reason is because every kind of psychological blow that these college students are now experiencing, they think they have to go to a counselor <laughs> to have it solved and things that in the past they would have solved somehow themselves, you know, and it ranges from everything from a breakup with your boyfriend or girlfriend to getting a bad grade, <laughs> having an argument with your roommate. In one case, the, the uh, head of mental health center at Boston College, which I'm associated with, told me that a student saw a mouse in her off-campus apartment and had a mental breakdown and needed counseling because of it. And, you know, they, all kinds of things that in the past, the great majority of students would have said, this is an inconvenience, <laughs> you know, this is a problem, this is, this is making me angry or sad or depressed or whatever, but I can deal with it. And, and part of the way they would deal with it also is by talking with their friends about it and working in, in these kinds of natural ways with it. You don't, but we've sort of trained people to think you're, you're not competent to solve your own problems. You've got to go to an expert. And so yeah. it's I think it's just yeah. really important that we we reverse this idea that parents and adults of some sort, teachers or other kinds of parents, have to always be there to solve their kids' problems for them. We there's this example I've seen. I mean, in Anji and the schools we work with, many times where children are given the space to solve their own problems, places where after ten seconds an adult would normally step in. Yeah, where they arrive at a compassionate or even yeah. difficult solution that takes time. I mean, one example is in Anju, we saw a child who was stealing the other children's blocks and their ladders, and he yeah. was excluded from play. They wouldn't let him play with them. And then he got really sad. And then he went up to them and was like, how can I help you? How can I do this? Now, imagine if at the beginning they had corrected that child and told him to apologize. Right. Or if they had told the other children, you can't exclude him. It's not allowed. You're right. not allowed to exclude people. He would not have learned that he needed to be a constructive part of their play to be invited into their play and right. enjoy that you know, that experience of, of collaboration. So right. what we lose, what we lose when we step in to protect in many right. instances is the ability to provide that protection for oneself in the present and in the future. I, I can give an example of that. So one of the other things we've done through the Let Grow organization is worked with schools, uh, elementary schools to bring age mixed real play into the school setting. Uh, so there are quite a number of schools now that have adopted what they call play club, which is an hour, usually it's just one hour a week, unfortunately, it should be one hour every day, but one hour a week, uh, free play, where uh, depending on the school's size, it could be all the kids of the school, age mix, K through 12, all playing together. There can be, I've seen it with as many as 150 kids. They open up much of the school indoors as well as the outdoor playground. They have all kinds of opportunities for play. This was something, it was actually my idea, and it, but it's something that we've promoted. Uh, I wanted this to occur every day after school for the entire time between when school ends and parents are home from work. That would be a wonderful opportunity, but they're starting small, one hour a week of it, right? And so, but also very hesitant. So what's gonna happen? Are the older kids gonna bully the younger kids? Are they going to, and, and one of the things that for the, the pioneering schools on this, Lenore Skadesi and I would go out to the school, we would talk to the, not just the superintendent of schools, but the principals of all the schools that are involved in this. 
And we would say, you know, okay, if you have teachers, I would have preferred that it wasn't teachers observing, but if you have teachers observing, and it turns out they all do, all the schools have done it. Apparently there's some kind of a teacher's union thing or something that it has to be teachers observing. You have to tell the teachers that while they're observing this play club, they are not teachers. <laughs> Don't think of yourself as a teacher. Think of yourself as something like a lifeguard on the ocean beach. You're not there to tell people what to do. You're not there to solve little quarrels. You're not there to worry about a skin knee. You're not there to, you're not there to cheer up somebody who looks sad. As much as you might be tempted to, that's not your purpose. Your purpose is there. Your purpose is to save a life if there's a life in danger. <laughs> so there are two rules in play club. One is you can't hurt somebody else. Uh, and the other is you can't break anything that's valuable. And so it's up to the kids to interpret what all that means. And, um, and so now some of the schools have done, they did play club for some of the schools had done it for two years before COVID with amazingly positive results. The, even the people who were skeptical about it became real believers in it. And one also part of what I would say to instruct the teachers is if you feel you have to step in, unless it's a clear and obvious danger, at least count to 10 before you step in <laughs> and see what happens. Uh, before you step in and then see if you still feel you need to step in. So uh, Lenore and I were there observing one time because uh, the uh, public television program was filling and, um, and they wanted us to be there. And so we were watching and I pointed out to one of the, ca to the camera person. So see that, see that little boy over there who looks so sad. Everybody's playing and happy. And this little boy is standing there. He looks like he's about to cry. He's so lonely, nobody's playing with him. And so I said to the camera, keep an eye on him. Um, I hope no teacher goes over to cheer him up. Now that sounds cold, right? <laughs> I hope no teacher goes over to cheer him up. While we were watching, an older girl, probably a fifth grader, came over and started chasing him. <laughs> and within seconds, they were both laughing and giggling as happy as can be. Now, what a better lesson that was than if a teacher had gone over. If a teacher had gone over, the message to that little child would be, I am so pathetic. <laughs> Nobody wants to play with me. I'm so pathetic that a teacher has to come over to cheer me up. <laughs> but instead, this amazing older girl wants to play with me. And, and what did the girl learn? She learned... I not only do I enjoy playing with younger kids, but I cheered this kid up. <laughs> I did something good. I, I can be a caretaker. I can help somebody else. When we allow children to solve their own problems, the lessons learned are the kind of lear learning that creates mental growth. When a teacher does it for you, the lesson learned is one of helplessness. I am helpless to solve my own problems. I need authority figures to take care of me. Well, I, I thank you so much, uh, Dr. Gray. I, I, you know, we're, we're already an hour and 15 minutes in, and I know you probably have a whole busy professional and personal life to get back to, but I wanted to thank you so much um, for sharing with us, for really engaging in this conversation, so much insight. I want to encourage everyone to buy your books, to read your to read your blog, um, and just to follow you and 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 learn more from your experiences and your research. So well, thank you, and I, I'm certainly a fan of Angie Play and for, and what you're doing. So well, congratulations we can, for you. Too. Thank you. I hope I hope we can continue the conversation. Yeah, I, I feel we'll like we could have feedback. talked for probably like two I know I'm, I'm, I'm putting I'm sort of an like, artificial. Oh gosh, there's end. so many yeah. more things that you've just touched on that I feel like we could add to. So yeah, hopefully this is just the beginning of a wonderful relationship and dialogue between all of us as well. Yeah. Great. All right. Well, have a great rest of the day. Nice you to too. nice to meet you both. Bye-bye. Great pleasure. Thank you. Bye.